give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Would you join me and stand as we say together our call to worship as we enter in this time of praise. O come, let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs and praise. Let us pray. Giving God, you sent the Lord Jesus to us to prepare a way for our new birth into your family. Christ's death has become our death, and Christ's resurrection our hope. So let our lives be marked by the presence of your Spirit with love. Lead us now in worship as we sing and give you praise as our Lord and our God. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing hymn number 483. Let us pray for the cleansing of our hearts, confessing our sins to the one whose mercy is everlasting. Let us pray together. O oh God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are small. 
We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. but in order that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are grateful to see all of you here this morning. For those of you who have gotten back from spring break, we are glad you are back safely. And it's wonderful to have all of you here worshiping this morning. We're especially glad to have those of you who are our special guests today. We're always honored to have our guests with us as we worship, and we're grateful for your presence with us this morning. And so that we might be able to call you by name, we would like to invite you, if you would, to sign the pew pad that will go down the pew in front of you. And if you would register your presence with us in that way, we would be most grateful. And to those of you this morning who are worshiping with us by television, we are honored that you would invite us into your home. And we are grateful for this opportunity to worship with you together today. As we gather here in this place to worship and pray, please know that our prayers are with you as we gather here today. A couple of announcements I want to share with you. Uh, we have a special mission team with us today from Williams College, and I believe this is their fourth trip to be with us uh, in Tuscaloosa. They'll be working on a habitat build. And would you just raise your hand? I thought I spotted, there they are, in the back like good Presbyterians. And uh, we are glad that you are here and thankful for your ministry amongst us in this coming week, and we pray God's safety for you as, as you work. As you know, this will be our last Wednesday night program this week. Uh, Todd is going to be doing a special on St. John Passion, and if it would be wonderful. It will be at 6 o'clock in the chapel, and we invite all of you to come and be a part of that as we prepare for the Good Friday service and this wonderful music that we will be hearing at that time. Also, uh, Please take note in your bulletin of all of the special Easter and Holy Week events coming up. We'll start our noontime services on Monday, and they will run Monday through, th through Friday, as well as our Maundy Thursday service and our Good Friday service. So we have an Easter egg hunt thrown in there on Saturday, so a lot of activities coming up this, uh, this Lenten season. And so we invite you to take note of all of those and be a part of them. We are going to celebrate this morning the baptism of Carson Dickey. And we want to invite all of our children who come down for a word uh, to the children to come down now. And we're going to put you in a special place as we get ready to celebrate this baptism.
as we come to celebrate this baptism, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. From the letter of 1 Peter, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of the darkness into God's marvelous light. From Acts, this promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called in baptism. For in baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Grant and Brittany, do you desire that Carson be baptized? And relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to Carson? And boys and girls, I've got a question for you. I want you to look around at all these people sitting here. That's your family. Just like you came from a family when you got here this morning. You have moms and dads and brothers and sisters and grandparents. Well, God gives us another family. He gives us our church family. And in the Bible, we're called brothers and sisters in Christ. So when you look around at all these people, those are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we baptize, we are, Carson, we are welcoming him to be a part of God's family here at First Presbyterian. So I have a question for you. Will you be Carson's friend and help him to learn what it means to follow Jesus? Will you? And will you help Carson learn all of the stories in the Bible about Jesus? Good, thank you. Because Carson's going to be part of our family here, okay? And to the church, do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Carson by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for the life-sustaining gift of water. At creation, your spirit swept across the swirling of the deep. In the days of Noah, you washed away all evil from the face of the earth. In the time of Moses, you led your people through the surging water into freedom. In the waters of the Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. We give thanks for the water of baptism in which you deliver us from captivity to sin and by which we share in Christ's saving death and life-giving resurrection. Pour out your Holy Spirit among us now. Renew us by your grace so that we may live faithfully as the beloved people you have chosen, called and claimed in Christ Jesus. Amen. Carson, come stand with me. What is the full Christian name of your child? Carson Grant Dickey, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Come with me. Let me part the children. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Carson Grant Dickey. He is now a child of the covenant. 
And you have made promises to him. You have promised to help him grow in his Christian faith. You have promised to teach him those songs of faith. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. You've promised to teach those songs. You've promised to teach him the stories of our faith that binds us together as the people of God. You have promised to support this family. In case you didn't know, raising children today is not getting any easier. They're going to need your help. And as their church family, you have promised today that you will help them. Don't neglect that promise. Take it seriously. This young man is a child of God. And he is our responsibility with his family to teach him the stories about Jesus and to help him to grow to be a full, mature man and a full and mature follower of Jesus Christ. Don't neglect it. Don't you break this promise. He's too precious. They're all too precious. May God find us faithful in fulfilling our promise today to Carson, to his family, and to our Lord. Amen. Thank you, sir. Come right on up here and stand with your folks now. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for this child, Carson Dickey, baptized into the life of your church. Keep him always in your love. May he grow strong in body and mind. Protect him in all the dangers and temptations of life and bring him to faith in Jesus Christ. We ask your blessings on his parents, Grant and Brittany, and his family, friends, and church family. Help them to surround Carson with love and security. Give them, give them grace and wisdom to teach your truth and your ways. Through their love for this child, may all learn to love you more. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Carson, we have some things to give you. I'm going to let your mom and dad hang on to that. But these are for you. These are books that you can read that will help tell you the stories that are in the Bible and tell you about your baptism that you're having today. And this is a gift to you from this congregation. All these folks are your family and that those gifts come from them. May God's grace be with you now and in the days to come. Praise. Boys and girls, would you join us up here now on the steps for word to the children? <laughs> You all just promised to be a friend to Carson and to let him know what it means to follow Jesus, right? Yes. One of the things we do when we follow Jesus is that we serve others. What does that mean to serve others? Got any ideas? We help others. To help others, okay. So if we're serving others, we help others, yes? To share. If we're serving others, we're sharing. Very good. Anything else? You know, Jesus was and is a very famous person. And you know, famous people in our day, if they have somebody serve them, if it's a, a, an actress or an actor, they might have a personal secretary come and live in their beautiful house to be better able to serve them and to answer all their emails and things, right? Or if they're a famous football player, maybe a graduate of the University of Alabama who went on, they might have someone and give them a big office to help them uh, in, in determining how to use their money wisely. 
Is that the way that Jesus means that we should serve others, that we should, that we should expect to live in a nice house or have a beautiful office? Is that what Jesus means, do you think? No, I don't think so. I think Jesus means a little bit different. Serving others has less to do with what you get and more to do what, with what you give. Somebody mentioned helping others, somebody mentioned sharing others. H how might we help others in that? How might we give to others? Any other ideas? No. No, no ideas here? It could be that you, every once in a while, you clean out your bookshelf and you give the books either to the library or to children who don't have books. That would be helping them in some way, right? It could be that you join your mom and dad and you go for a cleanup day somewhere in our community or you might go to the soup kitchen and help serve those who don't have enough food. It could be that um, you do something kind for someone at, at school. There are lots of ways that we can serve others, right? Think about that this week. All right, let us pray. I want you to have prayer hands and repeat after me. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for sending us to Jesus. Loving God, repeat after me. Thank you for sending us Jesus to show us how to love one another. To show us how to love one another. Help us to find ways we can serve others this week. Help us to find. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the children go either to godly play or back to their parents, I invite you to turn to one another and extend the right hand of fellowship. Let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear these words from John's Gospel in the 12th chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. 
Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some Greeks have come to Jesus wanting to speak with him. They don't just want to see him from afar. They want to have a meeting with him. They want to talk to him. And so they go to Philip first. Philip was a Greek name, and they probably felt some affinity with him because of that. So they went to Philip first and said, Philip, we want to have a meeting with Jesus. He turned to Andrew, and the two of them went to Jesus and said, there are some Greeks here who want to see you and meet with you. You will remember earlier in this gospel, it was Philip and Andrew that went and found Nathanael and Peter and brought them to Jesus. And now the Greeks are coming, and now it is again Philip and Andrew who are bringing the Gentiles to Jesus. This marks a real change in the ministry of Jesus and is a foreshadowing of what is to come in the days ahead after his resurrection. But they come, obviously, inquiring about what it means to be his follower. And Jesus doesn't cut him any slack. He doesn't say, well, since you're Greeks, this is what you have to do. Bonhoeffer said that when Christ calls, he bids us come and die. And that is essentially what Jesus is telling those Greeks and his disciples at this time. He says, if you're going to follow me, you are going to have to die. All of your self-interest will have to die. He uses an agricultural metaphor and he talks about a small seed being planted in the ground that once it germinates and brings and comes to life and pokes its head out of the ground, it bears much fruit, but it has to die first. And so he's telling us, if you're going to follow me, You're going to have to first die if you're going to be able to bear fruit. The life that comes from you will be evident that it is the life of God within you that will be bearing fruit in your life. And then he goes on to tell them that those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Hate the life in this world. We want to hang on to it. We want to hang on to everything we can. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, I've got to be your first allegiance. When I put my flag up, that is the only flag you're going to salute. It is allegiance to me and me only that I demand from you. You cannot hang on to everything that this world offers and hang on to me and think you're going to live a comfortable, peaceful, fruitful life. There is no more miserable person walking on the face of this earth than a Christian with divided loyalties. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, I've got to have all that you are and all that you have, and you have to be mine and mine alone. You have to die to everything else in order to have a life that bears fruit. A life that is full and meaningful, he says in the gospel. And you've got to follow me with a single-minded heart. In reading over church history, there are very few people who exemplified that kind of life as much as Evan Roberts did. Roberts was a key figure in the Welch revival that happened in 1904 and 1905. He was a coal miner from the age of 11. He went with his dad to the coal mines in Wales and worked there until he was 20 years old. God had been dealing with this young man's heart and life for many years. And he left the coal mine to go to school where he was going to study the Bible. But after only three months of study, he went to the principal of the school and said, I have to go home. God is telling me to go home. 
You see, just prior to that, the Welch revival was already beginning to start. There were flickers of it around. And Roberts went to a prayer meeting, and any great awakening and revival movement that has ever happened has always been born in prayer. And Roberts went to this prayer meeting where he heard this young lady say, Lord, bend me. Bend me. And that became Robert's prayer. Bend me to your will. Bend me to your way. Bend all of my actions and attitudes to who you are. Conform me to the very person of Jesus Christ. Bend me and shape me so that I can give God glory in everything that I think and in everything that I do. Bend me. So Roberts went home. He attended a church, he and his family attended the Calvinistic Methodist Church, and I bet you didn't know that existed. Sometime later it changed its name to the Presbyterian Church of Wales, but for many, many years it was known as the Calvinist Methodist Church. And so he went to his home church to a youth meeting. He wasn't asked to speak by the pastor or anything of that nature. But Roberts got up and gave four points. He said, confess all known sin. If you have sinned against someone, confess it and make it right. Confess all known sin. Proclaim Christ publicly. Let everyone know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Stop all doubtful habits. Anything going on in your life that you have a question about, stop doing it. Stop doing it. And be a follower of Jesus Christ. He laid those things out to them and said, this is the way to live. And basically sat down. But God was doing something. God was transforming people's lives. And within a matter of months, people across Wales were packing their churches. Not just the Calvinistic Methodist Church, but every church in the country was packed. Not just on Sundays, but on Monday nights, Tuesday nights. Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday. They were packing their churches out. People getting gripped by the Spirit of God in their lives. And as their lives were being transformed, all people were being drawn to it. There was one meeting in a church that started at 4 o'clock, and by the time Roberts got there, it was 7. And the place was so packed that in order for him to get up to the pulpit... He had to walk over the shoulders of everybody in front of him until he got to the front of the sanctuary and it was recorded that the only thing he said that evening was, let us pray. And the whole congregation erupted in spontaneous prayer as people confessed their sins and poured their lives out to God. The record says that the pastor of the church had a man sitting and kneeling next to him and finally jabbed him with his elbow and said, would you stop praying and tell me how I can know this Jesus? The movement of God throughout Wales was dramatic. It not only packed the churches night after night after night, but the implications in throughout the life of Wales was just dramatic. Drunkenness dropped by a half. Illegitimacy in all of the counties of Wales dropped by 40%. Roberts had had a vision while he was at that school that God had given him that he was going to see 100,000 people come to know Christ. And within months of the beginning of the Welch revival, over 100,000 of his countrymen professed faith in Jesus Christ and sought to, follow, sought to follow Him. But the 
The ramifications of it went on and on and on. Judges were presented with white gloves because there were no cases to try. Police departments were laying off people because they had no crime to investigate. One sergeant was interviewed and he says, what are, your, what are the police officers doing? And he said, we're going with the people. And they said, what do you mean they're going with the people? He had a police, he had 16 officers under him. He says, well, we've divided into four quartets and we go and visit the churches and sing. Any church that needs a gospel quartet, we go and we sing at those churches and that's how we're spending our time. There was no crime. One dramatic effect was that coal production dropped. For a number of months, as the, as the awakening in Wales was spreading, the coal production dropped, not because they weren't going to work or because they were slowing down intentionally. But remember, in that day, they used pit ponies to pull the coal cars through the mine shafts. And these ponies, these small miniature dwarf ponies, would pull the coal cars laden with the coal as they hauled it up out of the earth. God did such a work in their lives that the pit ponies could no longer recognize the non-expletive commands that were being given to them. And they didn't know how to act. They didn't know what go meant any longer or stop because it wasn't expletive laden with, with all of the curse words that they could come up with. And it took a while for those pit ponies to learn the new language of the miners because God had done something in their life and not only transformed their lives, but transformed their language as well. A newspaper reporter five years after the, after the awakening in Wales was very skeptical about what it meant and went back to, do, to investigate the results of the, of the Welch revival. And five years later, he found that in case after case, somewhere between 75 to 80 percent of the people who had come to Christ during the Welch revival were still in attendance at church. During a time of mass migration from Wales to the Americas, still 75 to 80 percent of the new converts to Christ were involved in church and coming. For decades, the churches of Wales experienced the overflow of that awakening. And Roberts, if you think he was the Billy Graham of the Welch Revival, you have a complete misconception of what he did. Oftentimes, he would walk into a church that was having services, and he would just simply sit down in the pew, not say a thing, but pray during the services as they would go on and on. It was recorded at one point in time that a pastor at 4 o'clock in the morning got up and told his people, go home! And they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They stayed. They stayed and prayed and felt the presence of God in their midst. It was a remarkable time with worldwide implications, both in this country and in places around the world. They said, as the, as the Welch revival drew to a close at the end of two, at 1905, that over a million converts had come to Christ across the British Isles, as a result of what happened in the Welch revival. Because somebody was willing to pray, bend me. Because somebody was willing to die to be a follower of Jesus Christ. One person completely committed as a disciple of Jesus Christ, willing to go wherever God would send, willing to do whatever God would call them to do. And as a result, a nation was turned upside down and lives changed and transformed, homes restored, relationships mended, 
all because a very few said, I'm willing to die. Bend me. Bend me. The story of the Welch revival is extraordinary. All that happened. Soon after it was over, Roberts went to England and basically retired. He felt like his ministry from that point on was going to be a ministry of prayer. He never really sought the public spotlight. He never sought to build bigger churches and preach in arenas. But for the rest of his life, he committed himself to a life of prayer. He died in 1951 having seen his country transformed in what the Spirit of God can do. God is still in that business. Jesus Christ is still in the business of equipping and leading his disciples. Jesus Christ is still in the business of transforming lives. He is still in the business of bringing renewal to people and relationships. He is still in the business of offering forgiveness and reconciliation. He is still in the business of mending communities who are broken with strife, whether it be racial or ethnic or any kind where relationships are broken and destroyed. He is still in the business of healing souls and making us whole. If we would just be willing to say, bend me, bend me. Give me the grace to follow. Give me the grace to put everything else aside in order to be your disciple. Give me the grace to be faithful to whatever you would call me to do. God is still in the awakening business. He is still in the business of transforming lives. It is my prayer for myself and for you that He will use us to be a part of such a movement here and to see the work of God in front of our eyes in a clear and dramatic way. It starts with God's call And those of us who have chosen to be disciples and have committed our lives to following him, saying, bend me, bend me. By God's grace, may he make it so. Amen. Being convicted of our faith in God, let us stand and affirm what we believe using a passage from a brief statement of faith, a statement written by those who were convicted of God's movement in their lives in the world. Friends, what do we believe? We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to share the following prayer concerns with the congregation. 
Infant Kanyui Tango is improving, is stable and improving at Children's Hospital. Uh, Ashley Mon's niece remains in Children's as well. Our prayers are with Mojo Weaver and her mother, who's in a Birmingham hospital, Jane Bostick's son, who's in a Huntsville hospital, and the father of a Ukirk student, Rachel Crilly. Uh, her father is in a hospital in Denmark with fluid on his brain. We pray for Laverne Mimi Stevenson, uh, Vicki Holt's mother, who is in Forest Manor Rehab, and for Christy Thompson's son-in-law, who continues to be in an out-of-town rehab. David Bauer is still recovering at home and requests our prayers for continued healing so that he may go back to work soon. And the prayers and sympathy of the congregation are with the Upchurch family, Jane and Frank, and their children, Terry and Caroline, upon the death of Jane's father this past Friday. His name was George Scrivalli in Anna, Illinois. It just happened that Jane was there visiting him at the time. The service will be held today in Anna, Illinois. Barbara Scarborough will have outpatient surgery tomorrow at DCH, and she requests prayers that no further surgery will be needed. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Redeeming God, we know that during the final days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up prayers with loud cries and tears and in faithful obedience, he opened the way to salvation for us all. Lord, with open hearts, we lift up our deepest needs and concerns to you, you who are mighty to save. We pray for all leaders and their peoples that by the power of your cross, you would drive out all violence, domination, and injustice in our world as you draw us to your Christ. We pray for our war-ravaged world that you would teach us to walk together in your way of righteousness and peace. We pray for the church as it attempts to follow your mission. May our prayers bear the fruit of action as we hear the cries of pain and suffering of those in need. Create in us a clean heart. Bend us towards a renewal of a right spirit among your people. We pray for the poor, the terrified, and the oppressed, and those who are too much alone, that they may find a home in you as we serve them in your name. We pray for the sick, especially those facing chronic illness. May your healing encircle them. As your son anticipated his death on the cross, in light of your steadfast love, may all who have died or who are dying be at rest in your eternal care. God of suffering and glory in Jesus Christ, you reveal the way of life through the path of obedience. Inscribe your law in our hearts, that in life we may not stray from you, but may be your people. Teach us always to pray as your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and takes on new life, it remains just a single grain. With grateful hearts, let us bring the fruit of our lives to God.
O oh Lord, you have provided us with all we need, and we are grateful. With thanksgiving, we return a portion of your gifts so that the gospel of reconciliation and forgiveness may spread among the people everywhere. Find us faithful in our giving and in our service, for it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing hymn number 371, Lift High the Cross. As you go about your week, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is able, and he will do it. Amen. <laughs>